Hi friends, welcome to the War Heroes channel. Today, we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. In no way could the Gumrak landing ground replace Potomac. It lay under artillery fire and the landing strip was cratered by shells and bombs. The heavy supply aircraft could only land at maximum risk. Then the Luftwaffe pilots completely refused to land, having lost dozens of aircraft to Flaken fighters and through bombings and crash landings. Two or three days after the loss of Potomac, not a single machine landed, although everything had been done from our side to put the Gumrak airstrip in order, an Army Group Don had been told. Apparently, they were not ready to persuade the Luftwaffe to fly into Gumrak. Paulus said in a radio message direct to Hitler, My Fuhrer. Your orders for the supply of the army are not being carried out. Gumrak Airfield has been usable since the 15th January, the place faultless, clear for night landings, ground staff to hand, urgent engagement necessary, greatest danger. At the Army Commander-in-Chief's hastily summoned situation conference, Schmidt complained angrily about the Luftwaffe. The senior quartermaster was in despair. Through him, the demands from the starving units combined in a single cry of distress. Don't let us die so miserably. Give us bread. Paulus decided to appeal to Manstein once more. Two hours after the transmission of the message to Hitler came a radio message from the commander-in-chief of Army Group Don. The objections of the Luftwaffe are seen as an excuse. Landing possibilities through Luftwaffe organizations and flying units found in every direction. The landing strip is considerably widened, ground staff faultless with all equipment as was previously at Potomac. Commander-in-Chief has requested the Fuhrer take radical measures, the present delays by the Luftwaffe having already cost the lives of numerous men. Army headquarters believed it had done everything possible to ward off the frightful distress. Hours went past without a reply and not a single supply aircraft appeared. Once more, Paulus radioed Army Group Don. Still no aircraft arrivals. Army requests aircraft crews to be given orders to land. In vain, no reply, either from Hitler or from Manstein. Therefore, ever more cries for help stormed 6 Army headquarters on behalf of the troops. Number of casualties from hunger mounting hour by hour. At least minimum rations are essential immediately. Suicides from hopelessness and doubt the order of the day. The army commander sought yet another means of lessening the distress. He asked Manstein to fly in a Luftwaffe general who could see for himself the landing possibilities in the cauldron. If there is such a general who values his life so little, I muttered, when I heard of this attempt. My skepticism was justified. On the morning of the 16th January, a Luftwaffe major, instead of the requested general, reported at our headquarters. It was obviously an indication of the value the 6th Army had among the senior commanders. I controlled my anger over this new betrayal by superior headquarters in accordance with the elementary principles of military propriety. Into my office came Captain Von Sadlitz, a relative of the commanding general of the List Corps. As a candidate for staff training, he had been assigned to our Army headquarters for part of his practical training. On behalf of the Chief of Staff, he told me that specialists such as tank commanders and staff candidates were to be flown out immediately. The Army High Command has also ordered Major von Zitzwitz, Hitler's liaison officer to our staff, to be flown out. Lieutenant General Schmidt would have you ask the course and divisions for the names of the officers concerned by telephone. We are hoping that at least another supply aircraft will land tonight. And what happens to the severely wounded? I asked. I have heard from the army doctor that all are now being brought to Gumrak. All the dugouts are packed full. The army doctor has been instructed to immediately seize the flying out of the badly wounded, said Salitz. I had to check myself when I heard this. In every modern army, wounded soldiers and officers were given special care and handling. In this case, those who were being taken out of the cauldron were those deemed still of value in the continued conduct of the war. The rest were being left to their fate. This could only be regarded as further evidence that the High Command had closed the book on the 6th Army. But the attitude towards this question must also have changed in our army. Until now, Schmidt had discarded every proposal of this kind. 
Why was he not now standing against the orders from the army high command? For a moment the thought arose in me that the chief of staff himself might be behind the new order. The general staff officers were also specialists. that were not named in the order, but those who were not might perhaps be included as the situation came further to a head. That it seemed to me that such an imputation was so low that I should try to knock it out of my head. I turned to the captain. Then may I congratulate you, dear Saylitz. Certainly you belong to the first of those that will leave this death trap. Have you already packed your things? I don't think it will happen, Colonel. Schmidt told me early today that I am indispensable since Captain Bear flew out. Honestly, I don't understand this reason. For days there has been hardly anything to do. I am sent to and from divisions to orientate myself on the situation. But for days it has been the same miserable picture. Only the resolution increases. Yesterday I was on the western edge of Gumrack Airfield. It was guarded by weak emergency units. Hardly any anti-tank weapons or artillery were available. And where a gun is still intact, it lacks ammunition. Nevertheless, the half-dead men act with renewed resistance when the Russians attack. What really goes on in the heads of our men? I asked him. That is strange. Many lie apathetically in their holes, staring ahead of them and hardly answering when spoken to. Others complain like mad. They have been lied to and betrayed. But as soon as there is an alarm, they bring their rifle or machine pistol up to their cheeks or jump to a machine gun or anti-tank weapon. Apparently, the fear of captivity is greater than the anger and disappointment over their plight that we experience here. That certainly applies to the great majority, Colonel. But in the last few days there have been here and their small combat teams who have surrendered with their officers. Eight weeks ago, that would have been unthinkable. I see the effect of the enemy propaganda in this. Captain Von Saitlitz said goodbye. As we shook hands at the open bunker door as he was leaving, I saw the Luftwaffe Major escorted by Elch left below in the gully. A vehicle drove up from undercover. The Luftwaffe officer climbed in and saluted as he drove off towards Gumrack Airfield. This visit did not last long. I am keen to know what has come out of it, I said. I too, Colonel, said Saitlitz and headed off to the Chief of Staff's bunker. Colonel Elchlep had noticed me. He climbed up the steps and shortly afterwards came in to see me. The pilot had nothing to say in apology. Schmidt addressed him harshly, saying that his arguments did not interest us. The 6th Army expected food, ammunition, medical supplies and fuel. It was a scandal to leave us so much in the lurch. Paulus agreed and said that the Luftwaffe had not kept the promises it had given to the army. The behavior of the higher commands towards the 6th Army was a breach of trust that nothing could excuse. So this major took the hiding for the generals. We can presume it was all exchanged in words. Do you believe, Elchlet, that our supplies will be improved by this? Can you hear the shell burst? The front has come down near our headquarters. How many more days will it take to eliminate the cauldron? We have not to be honest with ourselves, or we must surrender. Then at least thousands of lives can be saved. All of this no longer makes any sense. The Army High Command has written us off. Now a few specialists will be flown out. The others can perish. I have my nose full like you, Adam. But an officer cannot surrender to the Bolsheviks. He fights to the last bullet and then dies. But those are just empty words, Elchlet. A meaningless fight is irresponsible, even immoral. In this sense, I will always act like Colonel General Paulus. Nobody can deny you that, but you will not achieve it. For Paulus' military obedience is the highest principle. In the following day, specialists, overwhelmingly from the armored and motorized divisions, reported to me. After the massive protests from the Army's headquarters, at least a few aircraft landed again at night with supplies and ammunition. They took these specialists with them to Army Group Don. I was really pleased that Colonel Sell was flown out. Back in October 1942, our doctor had urgently advised to stay for him at a cure resort, and the application was already approved when the Red Army's big offensive began. Sell immediately declared that he would not leave the troops in the lurch. At the beginning of December, he took over a battle group at Schur and later received from Schmidt an unnecessary order to fly into the cauldron. Although a serious health problem meant it was difficult for him to stay on his feet, he made no attempt to fly out. He eventually went several days later. After I had asked him to take a photograph of me with my camera, 
as I wanted to send the film and camera by the next courier aircraft to my wife and daughter. Afterwards, we had a frank conversation. Cell, an old member of the National Socialist Party and holder of the party's golden badge, told me that he had again advised Paulus to go against Hitler's orders and to do what the responsibility towards his army imposed. But for Paulus, Schmidt's views applied only to tactical matters, and Cell regarded this as disastrous. The Colonel General, together with his Chief of Staff, held the joint responsibility for the senseless sacrifice of the Sixth Army. In a burst of anger against Hitler and Goering, Cell took the party badge from his uniform, threw it on the hard frozen snow and trampled it in. Although this scene was little more than a gesture without any further consequences, it impressed me then because it at least signified a revolt where Paulus, Schmidt, Elchlepp and the others demanded unconditional obedience to immoral orders. Possibly the chief of staff would not have placed Colonel Sell on the courier list if he had heard of our conversation. On the 22nd January, Schmidt told me that Sell would be leaving the cauldron. I wanted to be the first to convey the glad tidings. When I called, his adjutant answered the telephone. Is Colonel Sell there? I asked. A moment, I will give the telephone to the colonel. What is new, Adam? You are to fly out today or tomorrow. There was silence at the other end of the line. Had he lost his voice from shock? Are you there, Cell? Finally, I heard his voice again. I hope that you are not playing a joke on me. My dear Cell, I would not think of it under these circumstances. Schmidt only told me a few minutes ago. I congratulate you heartily and am delighted that someone gets out who will not waffle about our heroic battle. I hope that you will not remain silent back in the homeland. You can be sure of that came resolutely back. Don't forget to come by me again before you go. While I was speaking the last sentence, Captain Von Saitlis entered the office. Excuse me, Colonel. Lieutenant General Schmidt is asking for you to immediately reconnoiter an emergency landing ground for our supply aircraft near Stalingradsky. Gumrak is under strong enemy artillery fire. There was not a second to be lost. I set off with some soldiers. We had soon reconnoitred a place and staked it out. It was only a few minutes from our headquarters. Colonel Sell was waiting for me in my dugout. He had already said his farewells to Paulus and Schmidt and he told me of his talks with both of them. I still remember his words very clearly. Paulus is really at the end of his strength. As he put out his hand to say goodbye to me, he said, Go with God and make your allotted contribution based upon which the commanders of the Wehrmacht can return to a really sound basis. That was very impressive unwritten, but in Paulus's mouth it was a destructive sentence, don't you think? You can imagine how difficult it was for me to say anything at this point. I did not once look him in the eyes. With the words, May the cross on our army's grave not be the death memorial for all of Germany. I left the dugout. Paulus has in the last weeks withstood indescribable agonies. His brain has been tormented every day, but he cannot free himself from Hitler's and Manstein's orders. What impression do you have of Schmidt? I had not seen him for several days and was surprised by his appearance. He no longer looks like the victorious, self-assured chief of staff he was. The man who until now strongly reproved any negative remark now sharply criticizes the high command. He released me with the words, Say everywhere you go that the 6th Army has been betrayed by the High Command and left in the lurch. It is very regrettable that he did not realize this sooner. He could have saved the 6th Army much misery. Colonel Sell had just left when I had a telephone message from the adjutant of the 4th Corps that their commanding general, General of Engineers Janek, had been wounded in the head and shoulders in an enemy bombing attack. Dutifully, I immediately telephoned this on to Army Group Don. Several hours later came the decision from the Army Personnel Office to fly out the wounded general on the next machine to land in the cauldron. By this time, the enemy had already occupied our last airfield at Gumrak. The aircraft flying in were instructed to land in Stalingradsky, although no landing ground was yet marked out. General Janek was flown out of the cauldron from here together with Colonel Sell on the 23rd January. It was one of the last aircraft to land. Most pilots, those who managed to break through the enemy flak belt, simply threw out supply packages, not a few of which fell over the Soviet lines. What did a ride if was fallen on by the starving soldiers?
The commander in chief's order to report all supply packages and deliver them to an established central point was ignored, and most of the contents were shared among the men who found them. Could we blame them for dealing with these things in this way? For weeks they had hardly anything to eat. The tearing hunger drove them to the edge of insanity and swept aside their orders on discipline so they themselves forgot their helpless, wounded comrades. On the 23rd January, the commanding generals gathered for a talk by Paulus. In place of the wounded General Janek, Lieutenant General Pfeffer, commander of the 297th Infantry Division, was tasked with the command of the 4th Corps and simultaneously promoted to General of Artillery. At the center of the conference stood the question, how should we continue? Generals von Saitlis and Pfeffer asked for a suspension of the fighting, while Heinz, Strecker, and Schlummer persisted in holding out. Finally, Colonel General Paulus spoke to Schmidt, Elchlepp, and me about the same problem. I referred to the senseless dying and suggested surrender, looking at Schmidt. How would he react? I was fully expecting an outburst of rage, but Schmidt remained quiet, seeming to approve the proposal. Only Elchlepp was still decisively against it. The commander-in-chief had become uncertain but he could not yet jump over his shadow. He decided once more to radio our superior headquarters with a detailed report on the situation within the cauldron and to request permission to capitulate. On the evening of the 23rd January 2, Heinkel 111s landed on the provisional airstrip only a few hundred meters away. Shortly afterwards, Lieutenant General Schmidt summoned me to his dugout. He went over the talks that we had had that afternoon with Paulus and did not conceal the fact that he was very disappointed about the holding back by the superior headquarters. What does he want now? I was thinking. I know that as well as he does. His following sentence made it clearer. Until now, neither Hugh nor any of the other officers has achieved any improvement in our situation, although they were all tasked with reporting the army's disastrous situation. I have the impression that none of them had the courage to tell the Fuhrer the naked truth. I have myself long wanted to fly to report in person at the headquarters. Now my ears pricked up. The catastrophic situation forces us to take a last step to finally achieve freedom to negotiate. I must ask you to suggest to the Commander-in-Chief to let me fly with one of the machines waiting in Stalingradsky to for headquarters to report to Hitler. You can be assured that I will immediately return to the cauldron. That was too much. This bad spirit of the army, who until now had not only acknowledged the order to hold out, but wanted to put anyone who mentioned capitulation in front of a court-martial, now wanted to desert. One could not interpret his demand any other way. Every simple soldier on the staff knew that by the next day, no further machines would be landing in the cauldron. Laconically, I answered him. I suggest, General, that you present this proposal personally to the commander-in-chief. Angry, but still in control, he glared at me as I left his dugout without another word. I briefly informed the first general staff officer, Colonel Elchlep, about this episode. He angrily jumped up from his chair. That's a mean trick. You must tell the commander-in-chief immediately. I am on my way to him, but wanted to make sure of your support. Then I went in to see Paulus, shocked, but also disappointed with his chief of staff who had always demanded that we fight to the last bullet, he accepted my information. Just let him come. I know now how I am with him. Soon there was a knock at the door and Schmidt entered. Perhaps he thought Paulus was alone and did not expect him to be already informed of our discussion. Almost with the same words that he had used with me, he sought to justify his flight out. The commander-in-chief, quite contrary to his normal manner, answered immediately, clearly and unequivocally. You stay here. You know as well as I do that it can end any time. No one is prepared to help us anymore. I think that any further discussion is unnecessary. Under control of himself, Schmidt stood there and left the room without a word after Paulus had tasked him with describing the situation in writing and drafting a request to Hitler for permission to capitulate. Then the pilots of the two Heinkel 111s received permission to take off. They had been waiting for hours in the orderly officer's dugout, held back on Schmidt's orders. A few minutes later, their machines rose up in the frost-clear night sky. Another turn around our headquarters and they vanished from our view in a westerly direction. Colonel Elchlet was waiting for me in my dugout. The question was pressing. 
what should we do when the end comes? You have repeatedly said, Elchlev, that you would never become a prisoner of war. You will have to decide soon now. As I see it, nothing has changed. A senior officer does not surrender. When it gets that far, I will take my place in the front line, and there I will shoot the last bullet. The last bullet I will keep for myself. You are talking about suicide. Has that anything to do with a soldier's honor? That cannot be a solution. Paul has told me that various generals have requested an order from him that no general or senior officer can go into captivity. Every officer should use his last bullet on himself. The commander-in-chief has dismissed this as cowardly avoidance of responsibility. He has taken the standpoint, and I have supported him in this, that in our catastrophic situation, the officer belongs to his troops and must share their fate once the fighting ends. I don't contest that the officer has to persevere to the end of the battle, but he can turn the weapon on himself when he has no more to lead. Elchleb seemed incapable of being turned away from his suicidal decision. I reminded him of his wife and his children. I want to see them again, so I have initiated a plan, better said plans, that have been outlined by various officers. I knew what was coming now. For some time now, Elchlep had been hinting at the intentions of some officers who wanted to fight their way through to the West. I had not taken them seriously until now. This night, Elchlep spoke in detail about these plans. It is time, Adam, to get you involved in our plans. I calculate that it will be barely more than a week before the cauldron is liquidated. Together with Lieutenant Colonel Nemir, Lieutenant Zimmerman, Lieutenant Colonel Heisman from the 9th Flak Division, and some young Flak officers, I will go to the fighting front in the next few days. There we will conceal ourselves from the attacking Russians, let them roll over us and then march off to the southwest behind their front line. The route has been carefully worked out. We have informed General Hube of our intentions and asked him to have supply packages dropped at specific points. I have drawn the places concerned on a map that one of our courier officers has already taken out with him. But that is nonsense, Elchlep. Even if you were able to get through the enemy lines, you would never reach your goal. Remember that our whole southern front has been drawn back some 400 kilometers westwards. You would have to creep for weeks through enemy territory. It is impossible. We have prepared ourselves thoroughly. Our rucksacks are fully packed with wool and fur items. Bandages and medicines have also been considered. For days, we have been saving up crisp bread and some conserves so that we will have the necessary supplies at the beginning. Have you also thought that this is desertion, Elchlep? A flight from responsibility, your plan contradicts your own demands to hold on. We will not be deserters, rather we are requesting Paulus to release us from our duties. We will only go ahead with it if he is in agreement with our intentions. Incidentally, Colonel Clausius, the List Corps Chief of Staff, is going to break out of the cauldron with his orderly officer on skis. We would hope to meet up on the way. Individual groups from the 71st and 371st Infantry Divisions will travel away from the Volga to the south to break through to the 1st Panzer Army near Tarek. Don't get me wrong, but these are dangerous fantasies. You know that the 1st Panzer Army is now apparently in the Rostov area, haven't you told the group? And do you really believe that the enemy will secure their rear areas so badly that they cannot pick out such crazy travelers within a few kilometers? Be reasonable, Elchlep. You can say many further words. My decision is irrevocable. With these words, he left my dugout. In the early hours of the morning of the 24th January, the following radio report was sent by Colonel General Paulus to Hitler. The army reports on the basis of reports from Korf and personal messages from commanding generals. As far as they are still obtainable, the following situation report. Troops without ammunition and supplies. Elements of the 6th Division still reachable, Indications of disintegration on the southern, northern, and western fronts. No unified following of orders possible any longer. The eastern front only slightly changed. 18,000 wounded without the slightest aid of bandages and medicines. 44th, 76th, 100th, 305th, 389th infantry divisions destroyed. As a result of strong breaches, the front has been torn apart at many points. Strong points and possibility of cover only available within the city. Further defense futile. Collapse imminent. Army requests immediate capitulation in order to save remaining lives. 
The reply came promptly, it was as unscrupulous as ever. The sense was conveyed in Hitler's radio message. Capitulation out of the question. Sixth Army is fulfilling its historical role by fighting to the last round to enable the construction of a new southern front. I told Paulus many times that I regarded this order as criminal and as a result, not binding on us. Lieutenant General Schmidt, who was hardly weak regarding the Army's fate, demanded further holding on. Paulus remained an obedient soldier and facilitated Hitler's criminal destruction of the Sixth Army. Towards 9 a.m. we heard rifle and machine gun fire and the explosions of hand grenades. During the night the front line had withdrawn to the immediate vicinity of the gully. All the members of the staff stood in front of their dugouts, the drivers ready by their vehicles. Would we come out safely from our bunker village? The 71st Infantry Division had prepared a new headquarters for us in the cellars of a former hospital in Stalingrad South. Already Schmidt's cutting voice sounded, get everything ready for moving headquarters. The remaining files and all disposable personal items were quickly destroyed. Two blankets and a briefcase containing underclothes and toiletries comprised my entire possessions, apart from what I was wearing. It was high time for us to leave. Already rifle bullets were whistling over the ravine. The windows of the dugout splintered under the pressure of exploding grenades. When we had occupied the headquarters eight days earlier, I had been tasked by the chief of staff with marking out a defensive line on either side of the ravine. But who was going to occupy it? The handful of people on the staff. The enemy had taken further advantage of us. He had used the cover of darkness to push forward to within several hundred meters of the headquarters. Our line of defense was already in his hands. Schmidt gave the order to the vehicles. All took their places in flying haste, the engines howling away. We left the bunker village in a rush, hearing the shouts of the Red Army soldiers from the other end of the gully. A few minutes later, and the Army headquarters would already have gone into captivity on the 24th January. Today I can say that it would not have been a bad thing for us and the whole army cutting short the final act in saving many lives, but it gave us a powerful shock at the time. The drivers pressed down their accelerators until we reached the first buildings in Stalingrad, then they had to slow down in order to get through the rubble. Slowly we went round bomb craters, rubble and stones and chunks of concrete, past the remains of walls and chimneys. What shellfire had not destroyed our troops had dismantled to provide building material for positions in dugouts or as long as it was combustible, for heating purposes. An officer of the 71st Infantry Division was waiting for us at the Zaritza Bridge. He led us to the designated cellar rooms. There was not much to put up, as we had left most of our equipment behind in the gully. Would this be our last headquarters? Our poor cellar holes made a mockery of the term. The person who seemed the least annoyed was Lieutenant General Schmidt. Soon after our arrival, he ordered me to find out how the surrounding ruins were defended. With this, there also had to be a landing strip for a Fiesler stork. Paulus shook his head at this order. What nonsense. Where can the stork come from? But carry out the instructions if it pleases the chief of staff. Elchlet complained about Schmidt's latest whim, but was hardly interested in what we were doing. My impression was that Schmidt had not given up hope of being flown out. Possibly he had established contact with his friend General Hube, either by a letter that he had given to a pilot on the night of the 23rd, 24th January or by radio. About a hundred meters from our headquarters cellar was a level area of open land that appeared suitable for landing a stork. Lieutenant General Schmidt ordered me that afternoon to make the landing strip identifiable by landing lights as he expected two of these aircraft that night. They would be towed in by two larger machines as they themselves did not have sufficient fuel to fly so far. Was Schmidt really so naive as to believe that General Paulus would allow him to fly out? Demanding that soldiers and officers should fight to the last man, but wanting to save his own life, what behavior was that for an officer who shared not a little of the blame for the Sixth Army being crucified? The night passed. The chief of staff waited in vain. His orderly told me that he had not closed his eyes all night long. Aircraft did fly over the considerably shrunken cauldron, but they were supply machines randomly throwing out foodstuffs. The pilots could no longer tell where friend or foe were located, but no Fiesler stork landed. My occupation as adjutant of the Sixth Army was at an end. 
I only had a pencil and writing pad, an official rubber stamp, about a dozen knight's crosses and the same number of German crosses. Sitting around in the cellar with nothing to do was not for me. I therefore took on the role of a liaison officer and drove first to the 71st Infantry Division, which lay several streets further south. Its headquarters fired on by enemy artillery at irregular intervals. On the previous day, Captain Von Seidlitz, on attachment as a potential staff officer candidate, had been killed by a direct hit. Just as I entered General Von Hartmann's office, several shells exploded again right in front of the building. Among the victims was the Chief of Staff's personal orderly officer, Lieutenant Schatz. He had come in a jeep and had been killed by a shell as he was directing the driver. The general briefed me on a city map about the deployment of the forces still available to him. His voice was calm and relaxed. I intend to go to my infantry in the front line by the morning at the latest. I will seek death among their ranks. Captivity for a general is dishonorable. I am of another opinion, general. Most of our soldiers still living will become prisoners. In our exceptional situation, capitulation and captivity are not dishonorable. We have long had to take this step. I see it as our duty to share the bitterness of captivity with our soldiers. We should say this openly to the troops and not commit suicide in front of them. Permit me to speak openly as I have done so often in these last hours. You too, General, should face the question of responsibility towards our soldiers openly and also towards your wife and your daughter who already grieve over their son and brother. The order of the hour cannot be suicide, but rather the will to survive. It was in vain. I know that you mean well, Adam, but I will go my own way. And that is how he said goodbye to me. Colonel General Paulus was shattered when I reported to him my conversation with Hartman. He immediately telephoned him, but he too was unable to persuade the divisional commander to change his mind. I will be with my soldiers in the last hours and therefore will go into the front line was how he responded to all the reproaches that Paulus made to him. And that was how it remained. My next route took me to Colonel Rosk, who was lying with his staff in the cellars of the department store north of the Zaritza. The upper stories of the building had been destroyed, but there was plenty of room in the underground storerooms so that even the headquarters were well accommodated. Rosk was prepared to let us have part of the cellar for ourselves. In the course of the conversation with Rosk, I discovered that he too was against going into captivity. He was planning a breakout. In the yard of the department store, he showed me a captured Russian truck. It stood there fully tanked up and laden with petrol cans. Ross commented on his plan. I have three surplus Soviet prisoners of war in the headquarters that are assigned to my plan. As soon as the enemy breaks in, we will mix in with their victorious troops and leave the yard and the vehicle in the resulting confusion. We can hardly fail. Everyone will think that we are carrying fuel. As soon as we have the city behind us, we will drive on to the west without stopping until we reach the German southern front. Join us, Adam. We will hide ourselves behind the barrels. For goodness sake, Rosk, have you lost your senses? You cannot believe that I would take your plan seriously. You would never be able to get out of the yard. And what of your soldiers who have believed in you until now and held on with you? Are you going to leave them in the lurch? I cannot believe this of you. Forget these figments of the imagination. My impulsive appeal seemed to have made an impression on Rosk. He looked at me in astonishment then gradually became more thoughtful. Thank you for your words. You are obviously right. A commander really belongs with his men now. I will seriously think over the matter again. We went back into the cellars. I was convinced that Paulus and Schmidt would approve of the change of accommodation. So we went ahead and marked the rooms that our headquarters would occupy. The return journey to headquarters was conducted under enemy artillery and mortar fire. The rubble strewn streets were almost free of people. Everyone was seeking shelter in the cellars and ruins. Only here and there tottered or crept a few mummified figures, half-starving, frostbitten or wounded soldiers looking for their unit or a cellar hospital. What had become of our proud Sixth Army? Why did it have to perish so cruelly on the Volga, 2,000 kilometers from home? I was so sunk in my thoughts that I hardly noticed when my vehicle turned off the main road behind the Zaritza Bridge. Suddenly, it stopped in front of our headquarters. Paulus and Schmidt agreed to have the army headquarters moved into the ruins of the department store. The timing was left up to Schmidt, depending on how the situation developed. 
Once I was alone with Paulus, he told me that Sadlis had sought him out again. Once in Schmidt's presence, he had demanded an army order to capitulate in view of the risk that the commanders might negotiate individually. He was quite right there, Colonel General. Everything has turned out as he forecast in his memorandum of the 25th November last year. Let us now put an end to this pointless holding on. No one can justify it. But Paulus refused even now, when the cleft between orders and conscience had been irrevocably torn apart. He did not want to follow the voice of reason. You must understand, Adam, that I cannot handle things any other way. I could not understand this any longer, but further words were superfluous. In view of the apparent inability of the army headquarters to operate effectively, individual units decided to handle matters themselves. For instance, a fourth court order said, with concern for the wounded, the battle can no longer continue in the city center. The present fighting lines are to be held, where further resistance is senseless, it can be abandoned and this may obvious to the enemy. In practice, this order opened the way to a partial surrender, thus contradicting the interpretation of the army headquarters. Nevertheless, the latter took no action against this. Derisory contempt for the dying army was expressed in a broadcast from the army personnel office, in which it was said that the awarding of the Iron Cross second class could be made immediately by company commanders and of the Iron Cross first class by battalion commanders. What companies, what battalions still had commanders? And to whom could these crosses be awarded on the verge of death? The army staff were aware that Soviet envoys had appeared before the 297th, 371st and 71st infantry divisions in the south of the city requesting an avoidance of further bloodshed. They promised food and medical attention for the wounded of all surrendering units. The commanders received the Russians, contrary to Schmidt's orders, but sent them back without having reached a decision. Paulus and Schmidt took note of these measures without comment. The 297th and 371st Infantry Divisions came under the 4th Corps. I was curious to see if the Corps' orders opened the option of laying down their arms, but for the moment we were unable to find out. The Elchlep breakout team had completed their preparations. The first general staff officer asked Paulus and Schmidt to relieve his and his comrades from their posts. Permission was given shortly afterwards the troops set off with a hearty farewell. It would subsequently be run over by the attacking Red Army soldiers in the 297th Infantry Division's area. In place of Elchlet, the Aya of the 71st Infantry Division, Lt. Col. Von Below was taken on the staff. In all, we were now down to only 20 of the original 60 officers and soldiers. The little group melded together again. In an outburst of despair, Colonel Elchless Batman, an old man and head of a family, took his own life. He could not get over his colonel having left him in the lurch. Distracted, he sat silently among his companions. No one took any notice of him when he left the room until the hand grenade exploded outside. We found him lying dead in a pool of blood. Similar reports came from the units with which we still had contact. Suicides increased as the end drew near. In several places, an epidemic of suicides threatened to break out, especially among the younger officers and soldiers. Late in the evening of the 25th January, we received a message that the 297th Infantry Division had surrendered, together with its commander, Major General Von Drever. The complete collapse of the army had begun. Hardly the next morning, I was sitting with Paulus at a small table in front of the cellar window when an orderly entered and handed the commander-in-chief a letter. Center Major General Von Dreber read the general in surprise. He did not open the letter immediately. Suddenly a bomb exploded on the street directly opposite our window. The window shattered and shards of glass and bomb splinters swept over our heads. Gunpowder gas blew into the room and the air pressure made the door burst out of its frame. My first thought was for Paulus. Once the smoke had dispersed, I saw that he was bleeding from his head, but it was not serious. I too had had the skin on my head torn in various places. A medical orderly was called in and applied light bandages to both of us. Once more we had been lucky. After this shock, Paulus could at last open the letter. He buried himself in the content, then he shook his head. That is hardly believable. Drebber describes how he and his soldiers were well received by the Red Army troops, being correctly handled. 
We are all victims of Goebbels' propaganda. Dreber asks me to give up the useless resistance and to surrender with the whole army. Meanwhile, Schmidt had entered the room, his face darkened when he realized what was happening. He raged. Dreber never wrote that willingly. He must have been forced to do it. We are not surrendering. We will move this morning to the department store to better control the divisions. As no stork was now expected to take him away, Schmidt had reverted completely to his former role. On the same day, we received the news that General Von Hartmann had fallen. Standing upright on the railway embankment, he fired shot after shot from his rifle before collapsing. A bullet to the head killed him instantly. Colonel Rosk was tasked with the command of the 71st Infantry Division. More bad news reached us on the 26th January. General Stemple, commander of the 371st Infantry Division, has committed suicide, reported a staff officer. His son, who was a second lieutenant on his staff, had attended the same class as my son at a Dresden gymnasium. His father had written in his farewell letter to him that he was going to shoot himself as he could not endure this misery. The youngster wanted to make contact with Army Group A towards the Volga with a group of like-minded troops. He did not get far before being captured. Several other 4th Corps divisional commanders feel this way. By chance, Schmidt discovered on the 26th January that Seidlitz had given his regimental and battalion commanders the right to surrender at their own discretion. Angrily, he asked Paulus to relieve Seidlitz of his position and put his three divisions, the 100th, 71st and 295th Infantry Divisions under Colonel General Heights of the 8th Corps. Unfortunately, the Commander-in-Chief let himself be taken by surprise and gave his consent. I was astounded that Paulus had taken such a heavy measure against a general who in principle had judged the situation from the beginning onwards more correctly than the Army High Command. Paulus subsequently saw that he had handled the matter too hastily but he was not prepared to recall Schmidt to cancel his consent. Paulus by now was in an indescribable condition. As a simple soldier, he was completely helpless to act, unable above all to do something to recover from the unscrupulous Schmidt's act. It seemed to me that he realized he had made a mistake at the decisive moment, but this recognition only weighed him down and paralyzed him further. He was physically and emotionally at the end of his strength. The army staff now consisted only of the commander-in-chief, the chief of staff, the Yaya, the army signals officer, the first adjutant, and some orderly officers. With two cars and a truck, we drove at about noon on the 26th January to our last headquarters. Rifle bullets and machine gun bursts were already striking the streets around the hospital ruins. An officer of the 371st Infantry Division reported that enemy tanks were advancing. The streets were busier than on the previous days when I was on my travels. Wounded and sick were making their way to the local district headquarters mid. There, according to the army order, they were to assemble and be attended to. But a district headquarters no longer existed there. They had to make room in the hospital. Sick and wounded lay under a tattered roof. Those who could not be accommodated in this building sought shelter in the cellars around until they too were full to bursting. As we crawled into the department store, there was not a cellar left in the part of the city still occupied by us that was not completely full. The divisional surgeon of the 71st Infantry Division told Paulus that only a fraction of the wounded and sick were getting medical treatment. In most hospitals, it was pitch dark. At best, the doctors and medical order lies working in various corners had a few candles or trench lights. Nobody knew how many dozens or hundreds of men lay pressed tightly together on the bare ground. If one did not move for a few hours, the man next to him would call out, there's a dead man here. Perhaps they hardly noticed any more because the one opposite was also dead. The doctors were almost helpless, having run out of medicines, dressings, and drugs. Often they had lost all of their medical equipment in the retreat because their vehicles either ran out of fuel or were hit by bombs. In addition to this, the doctors and medical orderlies could hardly stand on their feet from exhaustion but they did whatever was humanly possible and were supported by the chaplains. There were unimaginable scenes as the command post buildings that had become hospitals were hit by artillery fire. Hundreds were crushed in the crowds, engulfed by the flames and buried under the collapsing rubble. A malicious danger appeared during the last days in the cauldron, typhus.
It followed the surviving men of the 6th Army into captivity and swept away tens of thousands of them. At first, hardly any were affected, but here and there a soldier was very tired and breathless, shivering and with pains in the limbs. Then he became delirious and suddenly died. There were also other sicknesses with similar symptoms, but typhus was by far the most serious. The virus, conveyed by lice in the clothing, led to a more than 80% death rate among those affected within one to three weeks. More than 90% of the remaining troops were infected. It was impossible to hunt for the quickly spreading lice in an ice-cold hole in the snow or a dark cellar. Almost everyone who staggered into the prisoner of war camps at the end of January and the beginning of February carried the germs of the deadly epidemic in their bodies. Only a few had been vaccinated and very few in their half-starved state could withstand the day-long tormenting fever of more than 41 degrees. Despite the selfless commitment of Soviet doctors and nursing sisters, typhus deaths reaped a frightful harvest in the prisoner of war camps. It continued the cruel game of German militarism with the 6th Army further, leaving only a few thousand alive. The blame was borne by the same forces that had chased the 6th Army to the Volga, keeping them there in inhuman conditions with orders to hold on, until only the wreckage of humanity survived. I shared a room in the cellars of the department store with Colonel General Paulus. Opposite, separated by a passage, sat the chief of staff with the Aya. The remaining members of the staff camped in two or three other rooms. It must have been a vast apartment store, I thought, when I made a tour around it. Through the solidly built cellars ran a road-wide passage, into which one could drive from the yard in a truck. There were storage rooms on either side that once had been lightened by large windows. Now piles of sandbags towered in front of the windows. Our vehicle stood in the passageway, protected by strong walls and ceilings against splinters and direct hits from lighter caliber weapons. The roof and upper stories were destroyed. The whole building had been burnt out down to the ground floor. Only the stone staircases remained that had once led to the roof. They seemed to sway but could still be climbed in the gaps between shots. From the second story, one had a good view over the wide square. Opposite lay the ruins of a theater, and there, between the ruins and the east, gleamed the glassy water of the Volga. To the right of the theater curved the view of the Zaritsa, a deeply cut tributary of the Volga. Army headquarters lay in the 71st Infantry Division's area. Colonel Rosk, who had been tasked with its command following the death of General von Hartmann, was promoted to Major General on the 27th January. The soldiers of this division were in far better condition than those on the western and southern fronts. Since the beginning of the encirclement, they had always had well-constructed positions and even now still had heated accommodation and, particularly astonishing, apparently sufficient provisions. What was the explanation? In my travels through the cellars, I came across several doors from which hung thick bars. I ordered the non-commissioned officer escorting me to open them. He obeyed my instructions unwillingly. The reason for his reluctance immediately became clear when I saw that the rooms were richly stacked with foodstuffs. Obviously the quartermasters and paymasters, and apparently also the responsible commanders, had not reported these in November as they should have done. What a filthy swindle! If the other divisions on the northern and Stalingrad fronts, even if only in individual cases, had acted in the same way, one could easily imagine what huge quantities would have been withheld from the hard-fighting divisions on the western and southern fronts. Rosk admitted that he had let the reports of the responsible army officials go uncontrolled. On the 26th January, the Soviet units attacking from the west had linked up with elements of the 62nd Army advancing from the bank of the Volga at Mamai Kurgan. This hill, so bitterly fought over back in the autumn, was finally retaken by the Red Army. The cauldron was now split into two parts. There was no longer any telephone connection with the northern part. The 8th and 11th Corps were on their own. Almost every hour the enemy attacked from all sides, narrowing down the two cauldrons. Several generals without command sat in the former city jail north of the Zaritsa, among them von Seidlitz, Pfeffer, Schlummer, De Boy, Laser. Edler von Daniels and Colonel Steedle and Beaulieu. These senior officers, assembled by chance, had lived with the horrors of the battle, the gradual wasting away and dying of their troops from the very beginning. 
Now they saw no sense in continuing the fighting anymore. Their consciences warned them to request the destruction to cease fighting, even at the last minute. On the 27th January, the telephone rang near me. General Schlummer wanted to speak to the Commander-in-Chief. I asked him to wait a minute as I had to call Paulus to the telephone. It was a short conversation. Schlummer described the situation and the state of the troops, who were totally exhausted and no longer capable of resistance, and asked permission to surrender. The Commander-in-Chief reminded him of the order to hold on and put down the receiver. About half an hour later, Lieutenant General Schmidt entered the cellar room that I occupied with Paulus. Angrily, he reported a telephone conversation he had had with Colonel Muller, the Chief of Staff of the 14th Panzer Corps. General, the 14th Panzer Corps is considering surrender. Muller says that the troops have come to the end of their strength and no longer have any ammunition. I have told them that we are aware of the situation, but that, as before, we still have our orders to fight on and that surrender is out of the question. Nevertheless, General, I suggest that you seek out this general yourself and talk to him. Paulus agreed. The journey to the city prison under enemy artillery fire was a risk, but they got through safely. Upon his return, Paulus told me that all the officers present had complained about Schmidt to their quite justified questions and requests. They got only harsh words from him. They pointed out that their divisions were completely exhausted. The battle groups were already individually making contact with the enemy and surrendering. No one knew if their neighbors were still holding their positions. So it repeatedly happened that individual units were being attacked by the enemy from the flank and the rear and were destroyed. They were asking for orders to bring the unnecessary blood, letting to an end with the army's complete surrender. What answer did you give them, Colonel General? I'd asked him. I referred the generals once more to Hitler's orders. Every day and every hour counts in tying down the enemy's powerful forces, countered Paulus. The enemy's powerful forces. Do you really believe, Colonel General, that the Soviets are still using all the armies that we identified at the end of November within the city area? The cauldron is now completely shrunken. A fraction of the original troops is enough to eradicate us with a death thrust. The enemy knows our situation fully well. The way in which he is conducting the battle shows that he is not prepared to sacrifice lives unnecessarily. Naturally, the enemy will have withdrawn some of his forces, but the fact is that he still has some here. At any rate, the generals and colonels were of another opinion. Hitler is a criminal, was one of the tamest expressions. As I was leaving the cellars of the town prison, I heard someone behind me say, just as we have been lied to, so will the German people be lied to. No newspaper, no radio will report the horrors that we have been experiencing for weeks. Goebbels will glorify our defeat. Paulus heard and knew all this. Nevertheless, he remained an obedient general. A new radio message from the Army High Command reinforced him in holding out further. It said that in case of the splitting of the cauldron, each part of the cauldron came personally under Hitler. On the 28th January, the Northern Cauldron was again split. The Army reported that evening to the Army High Command, strong enemy breach along the Gumrak Stalingrad railway line split the Army's front. In the Northern Cauldron 11th Corps, Central Cauldron 8th and List Corps, and Southern Cauldron 14th Panzer Corps and 4th Corps without units, Army seeking to form a new defensive front along the Northern Edge and Western Frontage. The army calculates the final collapse of its resistance by the 1st February. When dusk fell, I was sitting alone in our cellar. Paulus had gone over to Schmidt. The artillery fire had become so strong by day that we hardly dared venture into the yard. Now, too, the sounds of fighting were coming from all around. I lay down on my bed. The pitiless fighting continued outside. Every hour demanded new victims. No one counted them. For days now, I had been unable to gather definite reports of losses. They ran only approximately 76th Infantry Division on the 27th January severe losses. 44th Infantry Division completely beaten. 371st, 305th, 376th Infantry Divisions wiped out. 3rd, Motorized Infantry Division reduced to only very weak combat teams. 29th, Motorized Infantry Division no contact anymore. How many soldiers were still alive? How many combatants did we still have? How many wounded and sick were there in the cauldron? 
The doctors I had come across in the last few days spoke of 40,000 to 50,000. Did the combatants still have any ammunition? Were there still rations available? Were the wounded and sick being cared for? Apart from a few individual cases, these questions had to be answered with no. On the 29th January came the news that Lieutenant General Schlummer and other generals had received some Russian invoice and were negotiating a surrender with them. Schmidt threatened them with court-martial. At the same time, Colonel Stable appeared at the department store. He wanted to speak to Colonel General Paulus personally. He had been involved in the heavy fighting retreat from the west bank of the Don when the new southern front of the cauldron was established and lost almost a whole regiment of the 376th Infantry Division in defensive fighting. His soldiers regarded him as a brave and fair commander. Paulus treasured him for his reliability and frankness. Two days earlier, on the 27th January, Stadel had said during a talk with the commander-in-chief that our responsibility to the soldiers and to the German people demanded the immediate cessation of the fighting. He had now come to ask Paulus to give the order to surrender. In doing so, he first spoke with Schmidt, who knew full well what was going on. Schmidt gruffly turned down the colonel's request for permission to speak with General Paulus and ordered him to go back to his troops immediately. Stadel had to leave the department store without having performed his task. In these last days, Schmidt also developed a lively busyness in other respects. Thus, he ordered Colonel von Bolu, commander of an infantry regiment of the 3rd Motorized Infantry Division, to see him. This man, who had spent a long time in the Soviet Union during the 1920s, spoke the Russian language, knew the country and the people and, as he stressed, was familiar with the Red Army. I had met him frequently since the beginning of the Eastern Campaign. Astonished, I greeted him as he left the Chief of Staff's room. Schmidt had me tell him about the Russian Army. He was particularly interested in the question of what one could expect from their soldiers and officers. I had no idea that your Chief of Staff could be so friendly. Likewise, the interpreter of the List Court was repeatedly called to headquarters to report to Schmidt. He was a Tsarist emigrant a former landlord and ensign in the Xeris army. With him too, Schmidt discussed the land and the people and the soldiers and officers of the Red Army. What was causing the chief of staff to have these discussions? Could it be a preparation for captivity? Was he playing a double game? Already he had instructed Ross to prepare the department store for all-round defense. Was he also preparing himself for captivity? It was late evening on the 29th January and I was walking in the dark passages of the cellars when someone tugged my sleeve. I thought at first that it must be one of the wounded who had sought shelter here in the last few days. But by the light of my pocket torch, I recognized Schmidt's orderly. The general himself was with Rosk, discussing defensive measures for the headquarters. The senior corporal led me into Schmidt's living room and pointed to a corner where a little suitcase stood. When he opened it, I bent down and then looked at the soldier in surprise. Then he said smiling, he orders all his subordinates to hold on, surrender being out of the question, while he himself is equipped for captivity. I thanked him for this very informative exposure and went to my room, so that is what it was all about. Schmidt was not applying to himself the order to fight to the last man. Paulus shook his head as he heard my observations. I would never have thought it possible. The man who has been spreading the rumors about prisoners being shot in the head carefully informs himself about the expected handling by the Red Army. He is reckoning on captivity, but lets no one else know about it. Schmidt was never my friend, but I took him to be consistent in his ways. But in the last few days he has shown his true self. His words and deeds are incompatible. It's a pity that you took his advice, Colonel General. Now it is too late to talk about it. We have reached the end. Perhaps another chief of staff from the general staff would have helped to make better decisions. But let us leave it. Yes, the end was near, a comprehensive defensive position was no longer available. There were now only strong points that could be defended by battle groups. Such a strong point stood opposite the department store near the Zaritza, which had already been crossed by the Red Army. It was occupied by Colonel Ludwig's battle group for which the remains of the 14th Panzer Division were grouped as the Army's Reserve. The battle group had set itself up in the ruins of a shop. On the ground and first floors, the window spaces had been barricaded with sandbags and bricks. This was now the forward position, 
the Red Army was already sitting in the Gorky Theater opposite. Colonel Ludwig regarded this as the last line of defense before the last headquarters. The building was already under direct fire from the enemy's infantry weapons. To the west of us, the Red Star tanks were only a few streets away. We really were coming to the end. Before us now stood the question, suicide or captivity? While Paulus had previously dismissed the notion of suicide, he now began to waver. After a long deliberation, he said concernedly, Hitler expects especially from me that I commit suicide. What do you think about that, Am? I was angry. Until now, we have tried to prevent suicide in the army. This is and remains the right thing to do. You two have to share the fate of your soldiers. Should a shell hit our cellar, then we are dead. I would, however, regard it as shameful and cowardly should we end our lives by suicide. Paul this seemed to be free from pressure by my words. He basically thought the same as I did, but wanted to check the consequences of my argument once more. That was his way of doing things. Paul the silence was now at an end. He began to recount his experiences and events in the Fuhrer headquarters. As Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army, subordinate to Colonel General Halder, Paulus had witnessed many of Hitler's outbursts of rage. In his presentations, Halder hardly ever got beyond his first sentence before Hitler overwhelmed him with words and went on talking. Paulus described how Hitler's greatest delusion was strongly reinforced by those subservient, praising people around him with Field Marshal Keitel in the forefront. In the main, as seen through these accounts, Hitler's role and character stood out flashily and naked, and it was barely understandable, even unpardonable, that a person with such intimate knowledge of him had continued to be a follower. This was the 30th January 1943, the 10th anniversary of Hitler's seizure of power. Schmidt had prepared two radio messages to Hitler, which Paulus had signed unaltered. The first read, The Sixth Army has, faithful to its oath of allegiance, in view of its high and important task, held its position to the last man and the last bullet for Fuhrer and Fatherland. Paulus. The second radio message included best wishes for the 30th January. On the anniversary of your seizure of power, the Sixth Army congratulates its Fuhrer. The swastika still flies over Stalingrad. Our battle has given the living and coming generations an example, also in the hopelessness of never surrendering, that Germany will win. Hail mean Fuhrer Paulus, call Jen. Was that not a mockery of the Sixth Army's dreadful fate? Army headquarters could not have done Goebbels as Reich's propaganda minister, a greater service. This radio message gave him an opportunity to glorify the senseless deaths. Hitler replied immediately, my Colonel General Paulus. Already today, the whole German people look upon this city with deep emotion. As always in world history, this sacrifice will not be in vain. The creed of von Clausewitz will find its fulfillment. The German nation now understands the whole difficulty of this battle and will make the greatest sacrifice. With thanks to you and your soldiers, your Adolf Hitler, similar deceitful pathos filled Goering's speech of the 30th January 1943. Cynically, he reached out to the still living in the outermost lying cauldron, but also in the homeland. It is at last the end that sounds so hard, it is all the same to soldiers, whether fighting at Stalingrad, at Reshev, or in the deserts of Africa, or over in the ice of Norway, who fight and fall. I was overcome with disgust as I listened to the fat Air Force Marshal. But my anger at Hitler's unscrupulous riffraff grew, that after his shameless betrayal they now also expected those of us still alive to listen to our own obituaries. Towards evening, Schmidt came excitedly to Paulus. It has just been reported that Colonel Ludwig is dealing with the Russians. I have ordered his court-martial. Poor Ludwig was my first thought. It will not be easy for you. As soon as the chief of staff had gone away, I expressed my concerns, but Paulus calmed me down. I will not tolerate Ludwig being punished for his individual negotiations. Ludwig was taken away by an officer with a steel helmet and slung machine pistol. This looked very much like punishment and fitted the formula that Schmidt had been using until now. Whoever makes individual contact with the enemy will be shot. Later, Ludwig told me that he had expected the chief of staff to have him court martial. But something else happened. Schmidt first asked about the securing of the Southern Front, 
for which Ludwig was responsible. Then he asked him to sit down. Then came the question that Ludwig was expecting, cool and direct. Tell me, I am listening. Have you been dealing with the Russians today? The colonel reported how and why it had come to negotiation. He had taken this step because of the falling strength of the troops and the tens of thousands of unattended wounded and sick. Schmidt watched him attentively as he was speaking. He did not interrupt him with a word, but simply paced to and fro restlessly in his cellar room. Several minutes after Ludwig had finished speaking, he suddenly came to a halt in front of him. This is not easy for me. You are going straight over to the Russians, negotiating surrender, and nobody comes to us, to headquarters. Ludwig did not quite understand this. This was one thing he had not considered. The pie-hated holding out general was suddenly in favor of surrender. Did he now want to save his own life after having for weeks followed Hitler's and Manstein's strictest orders and in doing so contributing considerably towards the downfall of the Sixth Army? If that is all, General, answered Ludwig, I believe that I can promise that early tomorrow, at about 9 a.m., a negotiator will be standing here in front of the cellar. Good Ludwig, just do that, now, good night. Colonel Ludwig had never been so bewildered as he was after this conversation with Schmidt. The latter, following his conversation with the colonel, came to Paulist, but did not tell him about the conversation, merely reporting that he had tasked Ludwig with negotiating the surrender of the army headquarters. This event rounded off the picture of Lieutenant General Schmidt. Only the day before he had been threatening execution by shooting, and now he was prepared to go into captivity. His life was apparently so precious that he did not want to fight with a gun in his hands. Naturally, the contradiction between fighting to the last round, as the troops had been ordered to do, and the generals and senior members of the staff giving up without a fight, did not occur to Schmidt. But this was particularly stupid of Schmidt, who as the army's bad spirit, more than any other, had reacted fanatically and inexorably against any reasonable thinking. This made his military failure also a deeper failure of his human character. After the chief of staff had left, Major General Rosk appeared. Briefly and precisely, he reported to Paulus, the division is no longer in a position to resist any further. Russian tanks are approaching the department store. This is the end. Thank you, Rosk, for everything. Convey my thanks to your officers and soldiers. Schmidt has already asked Ludwig to negotiate with the Red Army. I threw the few last remaining pieces of paper into the stove, as well as the dozen knight's crosses and German crosses, but my conscience would not let me part with my duty stamp. I threw it into my briefcase together with the ink pad. Then I went to my assistant, Lieutenant Schlesinger, and the clerks to bring them up to date on the situation and check to see if everything had been destroyed here too. For an hour or more I sat with the army commander-in-chief in our narrow room. A candle flickered between us. Not a word was spoken. Both of us were busy with our own thoughts. Finally, I broke the silence. Colonel General, you must get some sleep. Otherwise, you will not be able to stand all day tomorrow. It is going to cost us the rest of our nerves. Midnight was past when Paulus and I stretched out on our mattresses. I jumped up once to see Rosk. Is there anything new? I asked him as I entered. Rosk was destroying the last of the disposable items. He asked me to take a seat, handed me a cigarette, and lit one for himself. A red tank is standing in a side street quite close to here with its gun aimed at our ruins. I immediately reported this to Schmidt. He said that the tank must be prevented from shooting, as this could mean death for all of us. That is why an interpreter with a white flag should go over to the tank commander and start surrender negotiations. I will deal with them myself. 